You know, there's uh, probably no more famous symbol of the American presidency than, than the White House. Uh, and in her new book, uh, The Residence, uh, Kate Anderson Brower takes us inside the country's most public private house. Uh, Kate is a journalist. Uh, she spent four years covering the Obama White House for Bloomberg News uh, after uh, having pr previously worked um, as a new staffer for CBS uh, and a producer for Fox News. Uh, in her book, Kate goes behind the scenes of one of the most visible places on earth. Uh, and to get there, she managed to track down and interview about 50 former residence workers, ushers, electricians, maids, butlers, chefs, florists, uh, most of whom had never spoken in detail about their experiences or even been approached by a reporter before. Uh, as you might expect, much of what these folks had to say was, uh, was pretty loyal to the celebrated families they've served. Uh, after all, the White House staff is, is known for its discretion. They're committed to keeping their political views to themselves, uh, and they often form close attachments to the president's wives and kids uh, who reside there for four or eight year stretches at a time. Uh, and it's probably not surprising to find out, as the critic uh, Henry Allen observed in his review of Kate's book, uh, quote, that life inside the White House uh, is quite ordinary. Uh, birthday candles are blown out, White House children smoke dope, people die, people marry. The head chef and the pastry chef feud. Uh, but it's also true that a fair amount of what goes on in the White House is special and rather extraordinary. And Kate was able to collect some pretty interesting, amusing, touching, and revealing stuff about America's first families and about those whose responsibility it has been to maintain the White House through administration after administration. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kate Anderson Brower. Well, you brought up one of the questions I always get asked, which is how how did I get these people to talk? And um, and you said it very well that a lot of them hadn't ever been approached by a reporter before. And so in a sense, it was a lot easier to get them to speak than it is to get somebody who's kind of a, used to talking to reporters every day. They were just normal people going about their lives who wanted to share these incredible memories they had of their time serving the White House. And a couple of them told me they felt it was just time um, to let their stories be heard and uh, to really humanize the president and the first lady. We hold them up as these iconic figures and a lot of these stories in the book I think help to make them more relatable and um, you know it's the White House employs almost a hundred full-time uh, staffers these are ushers, chefs, florists and then they also bring in about 250 part-timers and I really set out to get to know as many of these people as I could and um, I got the inspiration for the book when I was actually on maternity leave after our son was born and all my friends told me I should watch Downton Abbey that I would love it and I had never seen it before and so I was binge watching Downton Abbey and um, it made me think of this very small luncheon that Michelle Obama had with about 10 uh, women reporters that happened to be who cover her and at this luncheon on the state floor of the White House in the old family dining room um, we were whisked away to this room that's very private I had never seen it before it's not the state dining room or the East room the rooms that you typically see as a White House reporter and uh, this lunch was very intimate and she clearly Mrs. Obama clearly had a rapport with this butler who was serving her and that's what made me wonder as I was watching Downton Abbey at you know two in the morning with a newborn I, I wondered you know, who are these people that make the White House tick? And this is really the closest thing that we have to, uh, you know, aristocracy or royalty is, is the White House. And so I set out to get to know them. Um, I, of course, read a lot of wonderful books that have been written. Um, J.B. West's Upstairs at the White House is a brilliant book about his time during the Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration. And uh, in that book, he talks about how Jackie Kennedy called the head usher, who's essentially the general manager 
floor of the White House. She called him the most powerful man in Washington next to the president. And Nancy Reagan called the head usher uh, the uh, second most important man in my life. And she named her dog Rex uh, after him, her King Charles Spaniel. So these are very lasting, deep relationships. One staffer even showed me a recent email from Barbara Bush uh, where she signed it, Love BPB, Barbara Pierce Bush. I mean, they keep in touch. He hears from her several times a year. This is a former usher. Um, but as you say, it's really about discretion. And they are not supposed to say anything negative, um, even though they witness and they hear all sorts of discussions about you know, foreign policy, national security. They uh, are supposed to just keep their, their ears shut and, and not um, eavesdrop. And they really stay true to that. I mean, I'm sure many of these people will go to their graves with stories that they'll never share. Um, but they did share some of them with me, fortunately. And I, you know, I really was honored that they took the time to to tell me some of these stories. And in some ways, I think the stories that um, I heard that were the most surprising were the more sympathetic ones. I mean, there were stories about Hillary Clinton um, and the president arguing during Monica Lewinsky and, and the tension on the second and third floors of the White House during uh, during the Clinton administration. But I think one of the sweeter things is um, about how the ushers and the White House how staff try to make life palatable, bearable for the first families. Um, and as many children, I interviewed the children of four presidents. I interviewed the Johnsons, two daughters, uh, the f two Ford children. Um, and I also interviewed three former first ladies, which I think is interesting because um, first ladies are very hard to get to interview uh, usually. And I think they agreed to do this, Rosalind Carter and Barbara and Laura Bush, because they wanted to pay tribute to the staff. And it wasn't about them. It was about somebody else. And um, and to them, I mean, especially Rosalind Carter was fascinating. She put me on the phone with her, Mary Prince, who was her daughter's nanny, who they actually brought with them from Georgia. And she had been serving time in prison for murder. And at the Georgia, um, at the governor's mansion in Georgia, they had this work release program with prisoners. And one of the prisoners was Mary Prince, and Mary got along so well with Amy Carter, who was a toddler at the time, that the Carters brought her in and said, you know, she had been unjustly convicted, and uh, she's African American, and they said that she, you know, it was a racially motivated trial, and um, that she, they don't believe that she actually killed this man. And uh, anyway, they put me on the phone with her, and they, she talked about how she came to Washington with the Carters and would play hide-and-seek with Amy all throughout the house and run around the South Lawn. And the Carter Library gave me some great photos of this bond between Mary Prince and Amy Carter. So I think that the First Ladies wanted to be more accessible than usual because they wanted to pay tribute to these incredible people who make their lives bearable in the White House. They feel like... You know, I, uh, Lucy Johnson told me that she always feel felt as though people wanted something from her and that people wanted to befriend her just because of who her father was and that these are the only people in the world who aren't allowed to ask for favors. In fact, as a maid, you're not supposed to start a conversation with the the uh, first lady or the president. You know, if they if you're making up their bed and they walk into the room, depending on who the president is, you're supposed to turn around and leave. Now, for Barbara Bush and H.W. Bush, they had a much... Um, closer relationship with them. So they would often stay in the room while the president and the first lady were carrying on a conversation. And in fact, one of the most interesting things I was told was that um, for the resident staff, they always breathe a collective sigh of relief when they walk into a room and the conversation keeps going. You know, if they're, if the president is meeting with senior advisors um, in the Oval Office, at the beginning there might be an awkwardness if a butler comes in and brings them water or, you know, lunch. But after a period of time, that goes away and they're able to just kind of blend in and there's no kind of strangeness there. But um, I wanted to read from the part about Hillary Clinton and how she really clung to the resident staff during a really difficult time. 
Um, one sunny weekend in August 1998, just before the president made his confession to the country about his affair with Monica Lewinsky, the first lady called Usher Worthington White with an unusual request. Worthington, I want to go to the pool, but I don't want to see anybody except you. She said, yes, ma'am, I understand, he replied sympathetically. White knew exactly what she meant. She did not want to see her Secret Service details. She did not want to see anyone tending to the White House's extensive grounds. And she certainly did not want to see anyone on a tour of the West Wing. She wasn't up for any of that, he recalled. She just wanted a few hours of peace. White told her he would need five minutes to clear the premises. He ran to find her lead Secret Service agent and told him they would have to work together to make it happen, and fast. It was a 20-second conversation, but I know what she meant. If anybody sees her or she sees anybody, I'm going to get fired. I know it, he told the agent. And you probably will, too. So the Secret Service agents assigned to protect the First Lady agreed to trail her, even though the protocol calls for one agent to walk in front of and one behind. She's not going to turn around and look for you, White told them. She just doesn't want to see your face, and she doesn't want you looking at her face. He met Clinton at the elevator and escorted her to the pool with the agents walking behind them and no one else in sight. She was wearing red reading glasses, and she was carrying a couple of books. She didn't ha have on any makeup, and her hair wasn't done. To White, she seemed heartbroken. They didn't exchange a single word on the walk to the pool. Ma'am, do you need any butler service? White asked her after she got settled in. No. Do you need anything at all? No, it's just a beautiful day, and I want to just sit here and enjoy some sunshine. I'll call you when I'm ready to go back. Okay, ma'am, White replied. It's 12 o'clock now, and I get off at 1, and someone else will be in. Clinton looked intently at him and said, I'll call you when I'm done. Yes, ma'am, White replied, <laughs> knowing that that meant he would have to stay until whenever she chose to leave. He didn't get the call until nearly 3.30 that afternoon. When he returned, White accompanied the First Lady on another wordless walk from the pool to the second floor. Before she stepped off the elevator, she let him know how much his efforts meant to her. She grabbed me by my hands and gave them a little squeeze and looked me directly in my eyes and just said, thank you. It touched my heart, White said, of her gratitude, and it meant the world to me. And I think that that story, and there are several like that where the staff really desperately wants to comfort the first family. The, the head pastry chef, uh, Roland Mesnier, told me that the first lady would call asking for a slice of her favorite mocha cake for dinner that night for dessert. And she would call at 3 or 4 in the afternoon and ask in kind of a sweet, pleading voice, which is not the usual Hillary Clinton that we see. Um, and he said it was his pleasure, you know, and that they all were kind of sad for her. And they felt embarrassed for her and um, so I think that that you know closeness and as you mentioned they also really have a very um, close bond with the children who grow up in the White House and they really love them and care for them one usher who was in his 90s when I interviewed him told me um, his best favorite memory was simply reading a book to John John when he was two years old and he remembers it vividly and you know just on the second floor John John walked up to him and handed him a book and said sit sit back, sit back, and he put his arm around him and read to him, and he said, I didn't think this two-year-old would have the yeah, attention span to sit through this whole book. But he did, and when he was done, he said, thank you, and it was over. But it reminded this usher of the four children he had at home who he didn't get to see because he was working such long hours. And um, it's also kind of a glimpse at these, at, at, at what life is really like there and how normal it really is in a lot of ways. So um, it was very fun to do and I'm still in touch with a lot of these folks and including one current butler who works for the Obama administration who um, has nine members of his family have worked at the White House as butlers. And uh, he's really incredible, and he's very proud of his family legacy, which is why I think he agreed to talk to me. And he's the only current one who would talk. I didn't want to approach a lot of current staffers because it puts them in a very awkward position because they could be fired. And I don't, in fact, think the, the Obama administration was happy that I talked to this one particular butler who still works there. But um, there's, you know, because they're really supposed to not say the, the president and the first family need to feel that this is a sacred space it's the only place they have to to be alone so i was careful to kind of uh not get too uh make people feel too awkward but uh anyway i would love to answer any questions you might have about the book Okay, this is a kind of a bureaucratic question i'm curious what the salary scales are for these mm. folks 
I'm curious how they get selected. Uh, I don't think mm-hmm. they're uh, in the uh, you know go- U.S. government jobs, whatever that is. That, that yeah. Thing. And um, I'm also curious um, as to any appeal process. The president mm-hmm. can simply fire them, or the first lady mm-hmm. can just fire them like that. So. Absolutely. Um, they yeah they serve at the pleasure of the president, and so their pay scale is not um, a typical government pay scale. I mean, if they start, uh, the range is really between thirty thousand, and uh, if you're the executive chef or the chief usher, you can make over a hundred thousand um, dollars. Even though in the private private sector, the head pastry chef told me he was getting offers from the Ritz in Paris to come for half a million dollars because they just want to brag and say we have the White House chef here. But he always turned them down. Um, but uh, and yeah, and they can be fired for no reason at all. And that does happen. In fact, some, um, you know, one of the fellows I interviewed named Chris Emery was fired by the Clinton administration for um he answered the phone in the usher's office and Barbara Bush had called because she needed help with her memoir. She was writing it on her laptop and she's very bad with computers. And she had grown fond of this one particular usher when she was in the White House who helped her with all of her computer problems. And the Clintons found out that he was talking to Barbara Bush and they were just livid because they felt as though there was a loyalty there to the Bushes because they had been there. You know, it was four years of Bush, and then before that it was Reagan. And there were some people who had a, you know, some people called out sick, and they called it the Republican flu. They loved the Bushes so much personally. And the Clintons, um, and maybe understandably, felt as though these conversations should be kept private. And they weren't happy about a staffer talking to a former first lady. So he was fired. So there are things like that that happen um, from time time to time. That's mostly through friends. A lot of these people are related, you know, to each other. Um, Nine members of one family works there. And then, you know, they'll bring in their um, distant cousins, people they can vouch for. You have to have an absolutely clean record. Um, You can't, you know, the Secret Service every five years reviews the records, interviews your friends. It's a very thorough process. So, um, and one butler told me, you know, he was, you know, so frightened of even getting like a DUI, anything, um, because he could lose his job. So, uh, no, there are, they're usually through friends or family because you don't advertise for these jobs. That's absolutely true. Thank you. Here's a basic question. What is the role of an usher? I should have explained that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the ushers are, um, so you have the chief usher who runs the White House and is the general manager, essentially, of the White House, who kind of is the conduit between the uh, social secretary and the first lady and the president. So the chief usher will often, like, walk the president from the residence to the Oval Office in the morning, and the president will tell him things. And it could be anything, you know, the water pressure in the house isn't great, or, uh, in fact, one Chief Usher Admiral Stephen Roshan, who was there for the Obamas, told me that the president would um, kept asking him, "When is the basketball court going to be done? Like, what's going on with this?" So, and finally, he said he was so frustrated because it took so long, and it was just this whole process. And one morning, um, Roshan turned to the president and said, "You haven't asked about the basketball court today. I have good news. It's finally done. It's, it'll be done at noon." And the president was out there playing with Reggie Love at like ten. You know, he couldn't wait to get it get it done. So the chief usher is very powerful, um, probably the top of the hierarchy at the White House. And then they have a group of about typically six ushers who oversee each department in the White House. So these are people who oversee the housekeeping department, um, the kitchen, the carpenters. I mean, there's an electrician shop, a carpenter shop in the basement of the White House. Um, and the curator's office also. So the ushers are really like the managers of these people. A floor, flower shop also. So, you know, it really is very old fashioned. There really is a basement with these different shops. Yes. Um, I just loved your book. I found it to be Thank a page you. turner. Thank um, you. And thought it was just wonderfully factual and not gossipy. I, I oh, just, thank you. I just, you kind of answered a lot of questions that I didn't even know enough to ask. I mean, it was just thank things you. that you know, you just the average person doesn't know about. But one of the thoughts I had after I finished was, and I wondered what your thoughts were. Mm-hmm. This is kind of a, a delicate question, but basically, my sense is that in the 21st century, 
um, the the service staff at the White House is is somewhat akin to the plantation mentality um, mm. in terms of the dichotomy between African Americans and whites in service in the White House. And I wondered what your sense of that was, and if it's changing, if there is if there is more of a mix in the um, in the mm -hmm. different categories of servants mm -hmm. in the White House? Just That's a good question. No, there are, uh, I mean, traditionally, there were a lot of African-American staffers. And um, in fact, I was just talking to someone about another project that I was working on. And he said that uh, Jackie Kennedy always, you know, insisted that John, John, and Caroline call them Mr. Bruce and not just Bruce. You know, Preston Bruce was the doorman. And um, some of them came from backgrounds, you know, where they had relatives who were slaves or sharecroppers and, and from the South. And so there was that kind of history there. And with the Obamas, I think they share a really special bond. But the Butlers are still mostly African American. But with the Clinton administration, they brought in, you know, more, it's more of a diverse group of people. Um, but yes, and, and, and they were adamant when I asked any question about race that they said that there was not any overt racism in the White House. And if there had been, um, the Butlers, one of the Butlers told me that the First Lady, you would see, you see yourself flying out of the gate so fast if anybody found out about it because it was just these people are like family to them at a certain point but I mean during the 60s there are stories in the book about how the temptations would come and perform and James Brown and the flames and they would hang out with the black staffers in the um, service area outside of, in the butler's pantry outside the state dining room and I think those stories clearly show that there was a little bit of um a delineation there and maybe a little bit of tension at the time um, but everybody I interviewed was really adamant that they they were treated very much better in the White House than they were outside of the White House in DC frankly but I think it is a more diverse group of people now um, the head chief usher now is an African-American woman um, Stephen Rochon who is the chief usher under Bush and Obama um, is also black uh, and, and these are positions that are you know higher they're, they're very high up the totem pole. But traditionally, you had people like electricians and carpenters who were mostly white. And then you had butlers and maids, and a lot of them were black. So, and they were, and there's a scene in the book, um, one of uh, the head storeroom manager told me about how he really had to go to the chief usher and make the case that it was unfair, that the, the staff was being paid unfairly, um, that the African-American staffers were earning less than the white staffers simply because the sort of tr the trade that they were doing was different as butlers versus engineers. And... Um, but certainly, I think it's changed a lot. Although Admiral Rochon, who was um, the chief usher there for, I think, about four years, Bush, the beginning of Obama, told me that he um, has had, he had to field some complaints from um, some of, uh, I think it was either carpenters or electricians, this is not in the book, um, but about how there was some racism in the um, in some of those shops as they started to have more African Americans in the shops that were traditionally white. So it's an interesting question and I interviewed Desiree Rogers for the book who was the Obama's first social secretary and she told me about how meaningful it was for her um, to see on inauguration day these very proud older gentlemen looking at, at the first family. They never thought that they would see this day come and some had tears in their eyes and one of them told me he's going to work there for as long as his legs let him stand up. He's just so proud. So um, I think it's very, very meaningful for them and it's very private. Getting them to talk about that is actually really hard um, because the Obama, you know, it's, it's hard to get them to open up about that special bond that is certainly there. Thank you. Yes, please. I've always been curious about this. Um, we, we sometimes hear about the royal family and their whole hierarchy of, of helpers. For the U.S. president and, and his wife, we don't have a, her and husband yet, um, 
do people draw the bath? Do they iron their clothes? Do they take care of laundry? <laughs> How intimately do they get involved in their personal space? That's a great question, and it's very intimate. I mean, Nancy Reagan said it was better than a five-star hotel. You know, she'd come back, and her bath would be drawn beautifully, and that they just all the president's suits are ironed gorgeously. Her, Nancy Reagan, started the process of having all of her clothes cataloged the last date she wore them. Um, and I mean, in some case, I guess it is kind of... <laughs> Ridiculous, but also like the you know they do get critiqued for wearing the same outfit too often, and who can remember? But yeah, I mean it certainly is that dynamic where there is a team of um, two laundry attendants who are doing laundry all the time. They are really very intimately involved. Ron Reagan told me a great story about how he was um, fighting with his dad after dinner. They were getting into a heated argument about the Iran Contra affair, and so he was started to kind of attack his dad, and. He he was having this conversation. His mother was there, too. Um, and he looked over his shoulder, and a butler was standing there with a plate of cookies. And he was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that I just said this in front of this butler. And his father was like, it's fine. No one's – he's not going to say anything. So they really see everything. They just – and that's why even negative stories are painted in very positive lights you know i mean even the kind of silence and sort of sadness during the monica lewinsky scandal is you know the the staffers would tell me that it was so sad for them there wasn't as much laughter on the second and third floors of the white house and that affected them and made them sad you know and they just wanted to do anything they could um same with the kennedy assassination obviously in a very different way but just how they felt like they lost a friend and i thought that was really um beautiful that they they really were touched deeply by these historic events yes so during the Monica Lewinsky affair. Um, I believe it was several Secret Service agents who were subpoenaed by Ken Starr, um, and they had to testify about uh, private conversations that they mm -hmm. had overheard. So my question is, are all members of the White House staff kind of subject to the same thing? Uh, one of the st nobody told me that they did, and and I I kind of broached that with a couple of them. Um, Lindsay Little, who was um, a houseman, who basically, that's the position of, um, he's on the housekeeping staff and he moves heavy furniture so that the maids can vacuum around. And um, He said that he uh, he did get called up to the second floor to talk to, he, and he didn't know who if it, who it was, the FBI or whomever. And he said, you know, he wouldn't have even told them anything, even if he had anything to tell, because he didn't want to see his name up in lights. So I think it did... You know, nobody told me anything specific about that, but I know that he was on the resident staff and he did have to talk um, to authorities about it. Yeah. I was wondering, <clears throat> excuse me, if any people of these staff spend the night in the White House, I would think maybe nannies might, mm -hmm. but are there graveyard shifts for people? If staff are needed at night, is there a graveyard shift or do people actually stay all night? No, the ushers have to stay there until the first family calls them or someone indicates that they can leave. And that's one of the reasons why they liked Bush 41 so much is that they would always call at like 8 o'clock at night and say, you can leave, you know. <laughs> Whereas with the Kennedys, they were up partying so late that one usher told me he would call his wife and say, um, you know, keep you can keep our son up. I'll be home in time to take him on his paper route, the Washington Post paper route at 4 in the morning. So, um, I mean, it's just all over the map. But yes, they have all different shifts. There's somebody always there. They stagger them. Um, Maude Shaw, during the Kennedy administration, lived there. Mary Prince also lived there during the Carters. Um, and, you know, the Obamas don't have anything equivalent to that, although their grandmother, Marion Robinson, lives on the third floor and helps with their daughters a lot. Um, and then she lives in a suite in the third floor, but I've been told that it's not really as grand as one might think. And I've also been told that she's really very um, appreciative and that when the florist would change her flowers out she would tell them stop it looks fine you don't need to bother with me because you know they're from middle class backgrounds and I don't think that I think the 
one of the things I learned with this book is that the people who are from middle class backgrounds, when they, it's really where you grow up and how you grow up that determines whether or not you like having staff around. And the Clintons always felt self-conscious, and the Obamas don't like the intrusion on their privacy. Um, and Bush 41, they were from a very patrician family, you know, the son of a senator. She's related to a president. They are used to having staff. And so I think that can cut two, both ways. Is that could mean that they treat them terribly, but in this case, they really treated them so well because they are like family to them. But yeah, there's somebody always there, which is incredible. Most of, Most of them don't sleep there. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. They always go home. Yeah, yeah. And they stagger the shifts. Yeah. Yes. So, as a professional journalist that you are and were, writing this book and doing the research and do holding the interviews, um, did you find yourself changing your perspective of what you had covered in the past when it came to dealing with the president, the president's family, the people around him? Did you, did you see yourself change? Uh, well, I guess it gave me new sympathy for them and what they go through, although it's hard to feel badly for anyone who's president because they clearly want this very much, and it's a wonderful uh, life in many ways. But for their, for their family, I definitely felt sympathetic. But as a reporter for Bloomberg, you know, I never um, – there was never, I learned so much more doing this book because like the real story is these people and these people who will talk versus, you know, you can go to off the record briefings with administration officials where they talk about very specific kind of steer a story a certain way. But this was much more honest and like revealing than anything I had ever seen in sort of the official capacity as a White House reporter. They never get you let you get close enough to see anything very personal. And there's one story in the book about the Obamas dancing to a Mary J. Blige song, which I love because it's a sweet, you know, it's, it's again, it's like a sweet look at them. I'm not sure that they would like people to know that, you know, because I think that they want to feel like this is their private space. Um, but it definitely, I think the answer would be, it, it gave me sort of a new sense of what life is like and how hard it is for them and the, the security concerns and um, the very real, you know, threats that they're dealing with all the time and the difficulties forming real relationships with people. Um, and I think that's one reason why, you know, especially with the Obamas, they have their group of people from Chicago, um, you know, Marty Nesbitt and Eric Whitaker and the people who they really hold dear because they're people who they trust and they don't think there are ulterior motives there. And so I certainly, it gives you a fresh understanding of what it must be like for them. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. I was just wondering, um, did any of the staff comment on how the, I guess the feeling among the staff and relationship between uh, Bush 43 before and after 9-11? And uh, how that might have changed? Yeah, that's a, you know, I have a chapter in here about 9-11 and about how hard that day was for the staff because they really felt like they were, you know, in sitting in this bullseye. They evacuated the White House. People were running for their lives. Now people always carry around with them, make sure that they have their some money on them because a lot of them left without taking their money. And, um, and then they did talk about how after 9-11, the president had fewer... Um, Obviously, there was less entertaining, and, and, and so there would be a lot of return to comfort food for the chefs. They would go back. He told me, the head chef told me that he went back to his mother's table and kind of started making meatloaf and things that for the president and the foreign leaders that were coming and having these very private um, dinners that would be in the state dining room only or the old family dining room um, that weren't kind of these elaborate dinners. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it changed forever for them. They had counselors come in from Bethesda Naval Hospital to talk to the staff. Um, it was a very traumatic event. One chef told me he'd have panic attacks in the shower before coming to work, and his wife pleaded with him to leave. And he said, you don't understand. This job was made for me. I have to stay. So um, I think it changed everyone there forever. And, and Laura Bush told me that it, it just meant so much to them that people stayed and nobody quit. Um, but I was really interested to learn that Bethesda Naval Hospital had counselors come in and talk to staffers. I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah.
<laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>